Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, and today we are taking a look at the 1903 Bergman Mars automatic pistol. No relation to the Gabbett Fairfax Mars, I should point out. Uh, Mars was a fairly common, actually fairly popular name for automatic pistols, it being of course the name of the Roman god of war. Anyway, if you've been watching the full series on Bergman automatic pistols, you'll see that this one kind of looks a little bit different than the ones that preceded it. And the basis for that is uh, Louis uh, Schmeisser, who is still working for Theodore Bergman at this point. In 1901 he patented a new design for a locking mechanism. Now he designed this actually for heavy machine guns, and this system with Bergman machine guns would go on to be used in the First World War. However, he also took the idea, scaled it down, and used it for the next new model of Bergman automatic pistol. Uh, this new system used a square locking block that sits right about here and travels vertically up and down inside the receiver to lock and unlock the bolt. These are still short recoil guns like all the previous, well like the, the previous locked breech model. And uh, but they're they're simpler, they're smaller, they're lighter, they're cheaper. It's really a much more efficient system and it's a quite strong system. Uh, they were able at the same time because of this new locking system to introduce these guns in a newer and yet more powerful cartridge, the 9mm Bergman. Now that's a 135 grain bullet traveling at approximately 1100 feet per second. Uh, for you metric folks that's an eight and a quarter gram bullet at about 340 meters per second. Now if those numbers sound familiar it's because Spain, I'm jumping ahead of myself slightly here, but Spain would adopt this cartridge and call it the 9mm Largo, and it gained most of its longevity in Spanish use that way. Now Bergman was still looking for military contracts Ideally, um, they were, he was still trying to get a revised pistol that would finally be good enough uh, for some military to adopt, because that's where the big money was here. Um, so it, at the same time he's simplifying the locking system, uh, making the whole gun a little cheaper, a little lighter, a little handier, less awkward. He's also reducing the number of available factory options. So you could still get these engraved or get them with shoulder stocks. We have an engraved one here, we'll take a look at a little bit later. Uh, but no longer did you have different barrel lengths available. If you go all the way back to the Bergman 1896s there were different barrel lengths, multiple different calibers, you could get folding triggers, you could get target sights, all that stuff is gone. Now it's just a simple, basic, single style of service pistol being offered. The stock was an option. Um, the stock is kind of a clever design where the stock latches onto the lanyard ring. So they designed the, the butt of all the pistols are all the same and you can attach a stock to any one of them. Now it is in fact with the 1903 Bergman Mars that Bergman is finally able to make his first military break. So he does send a gun in 45 caliber to the British, and we have that gun here, which we'll take a look at in a moment. Uh, they rejected it. Uh, they had initially rejected some earlier experimental 1899 models because they weren't 45 caliber, and the British were dead set on a 45 caliber pistol. Then apparently they rejected this one because the bullet weight wasn't heavy enough. Uh, the, the Brits used a fairly heavy bullet, like 265 grains in their revolvers, and they wanted something equally heavy for the automatic pistol. I don't know exactly what Bergman supplied, but apparently it, it was 45 but it wasn't heavy enough, so the Brits rejected it again. Uh, another test pistol went to the US, and I believe, I can't prove it, but I'm, I think uh, we also have the US test pistol here, or one of them. Uh, that was shipped with ammunition. The ammunition was impounded by customs, very helpfully, uh, so the pistol ended up having to use Frankfurt uh, Armory ammunition, which was notoriously bad, and that ammunition actually caused problems for almost every pistol in the US uh, 1907 pistol trials. The Bergman was no exception, um, the primers were quite hard and the Bergman was not able to reliably detonate primers and so it was dropped from the competition for that reason. Uh, although apparently the US trials officers also didn't really like this idea of the magazine forward of the grip. So even if it had run reliably they still might not have been particularly interested in it. So those two failed, but finally in September of 1905 the Spanish government officially adopted this pistol. Now the Spanish had tried pretty much everything that was out there in the, in the way of automatic pistols. They, they ran a series of trials, they tested the C96 broom handle, they tested the FN model 1900, the FN model 1903, uh, the Schwarzloss model 1898, a couple weird uh, domestic Spanish automatic pistols, the 1901 Monlicker, 
Um, what else? The Luger they tested, one of the early versions of the Luger. Uh, the Borchardt they tested in addition to the Luger. And there are a couple other, oh, uh, Sharola Ianitua they tested, and there were a couple others. Pretty much everything they could possibly get their hands on they tested out. And ultimately their trials came down to the final two potential guns being the Bergman Mars 1903 and the C96 broom handle. And they ended up choosing the Bergman Mars for a number of reasons. They liked the fact that it could be fed either by clips or by detachable magazine. And then they also found it to be cheaper, simpler, and lighter. So cool. You know, good for Bergman, he finally makes a sale, but there's a problem. Uh, Bergman is an industrialist. Through this whole time Bergman never actually designed anything himself. He was a financier and an arranger. He had the factory facilities for tooling and experiments. Um, Louis Schmeisser is the guy who was actually doing the engineering work on these pistols. And most of the actual production was done by V.C. Schilling out of Suhl, Germany. Well, in 1904 the Schilling company is purchased by Krieghoff, and Krieghoff decides that they're no longer interested in working with Bergman. Why exactly, I don't know, maybe they were competing on some other products, maybe it wasn't profitable for them. For whatever reason, Krieghoff decides to shut down this cooperation, and unfortunately this leaves Bergman with a bit of a problem. He's got the facilities to make some of these pistols, and in total he made about a thousand of these guns in his own shop, his own factory. But then the Spanish show up and they adopt the gun, but they only order 3,000. Which is like this in-between thing. It's good, but it's kind of got some downsides because tooling up a, a production line to make 3,000 of these pistols at one run is an expensive proposition, and it's not really necessarily justified by an order of 3,000. And Bergman was really hoping he could get at least one other country to adopt the gun so that he could get a larger quantity to produce all at once. And spent a couple of years trying to do that and also looking for a new subcontractor to make the guns for him. By 1907 he finally had someone in mind, and that was AEP out of Belgium, which I will make an attempt to not butcher the pronunciation of uh, Ancien Establishment Pipier, something like that. Piper is what it looks like. So he licensed production to them in 1907 and they got into work producing the Spanish guns. However, there's been a two year interim here between when the Spanish actually ordered the guns and when there's any chance of them actually showing up. During that time the Spanish decided there were actually a couple of little changes they'd like made. So they communicated those changes to Bergman and this actually resulted in the 1908 pattern of the gun, which we will address in the next video, not in this one. So going back to the model 1903, um, overall what we're looking at is a new locking system a new cartridge, we still have detachable mags, there were two different sizes at least, you can see here. I believe this is six, maybe seven, and I suspect this is either eight or more likely ten. Uh, it's probably documented somewhere, but I haven't been able to find it in the run up to this video. So a couple different sizes of mag, and there's really no reason you couldn't have an even longer magazine if you wanted to make one. Um, but I believe the standard capacity was six. Uh, there is a stripper clip guide, so you can load them by clip as well if you'd like to. and like I said, about a thousand of these were made. They were sold commercially as well. That's where most of them went out because of course the only military order was the Spanish one which didn't get produced for several years after it was actually ordered. So, With all that in mind, let's go ahead and take a closer look at the standard pistols and we'll also take a look at these 45 caliber trials guns. All right, so we have a number of features that are holdovers from previous Bergman pistols. We have a number of features that are brand new. So let's go through everything. One thing that stayed the same on the 1903 is the safety here. This is in the fire position. Flip it up like that, that's the safe position. In the safe position the hammer is locked. You can also put it on safe with the hammer cocked, and it disconnects the trigger. So that's handy. This button here is actually kind of a, a cam plunger sort of thing that removes the side plate. Um, I'm not going to pull that one off on this gun, but we'll take a look at that in a future video. The magazine release is now located in the front of the trigger guard. Honestly this seems maybe like a decent idea that you can use your trigger finger to pop out the magazine. The problem is every one of these I've handled that magazine spring is actually really quite stiff and it's difficult to do that. So to take it out you kind of have to use your second hand to pop the release, pull the magazine out. Uh, this is the standard size magazine. There was also of course 
a larger magazine, and there were probably other uh, different sizes made as well at various times. They do of course have viewing holes so you can see how much ammo is in there, know when you're fully loaded. Um, although, unlike the previous version of the gun, there are, no more, there are no longer viewing holes in the side of the frame. Of course, that, those always make a really good point for dirt and such to get into the gun. It shouldn't be at all surprising that they got rid of those. The trigger is the trigger, not a whole lot to say there. This is a short recoil action, so the whole slide and barrel assembly snaps forward or snaps backward when you fire. And this is actually the locking block. The top surface of it there is exposed, and there's a cam inside. So when you fire, it actually pivots down right there. You can see it lift up, and then it gets cammed down. As soon as it cams down, it is no longer holding the bolt into the, the, the barrel extension. So at this point, the bolt is now unlocked, and the bolt can travel backward on its own to cycle, throw out the empty cartridge, and chamber a new one. The bolt then goes all the way forward to this point, and then the whole assembly moves forward under the same spring tension until this locking block is pivoted back up and once again locked and ready to fire. The sights on the 1903 are still a pretty typical V-notch and front post there. Um, not a whole lot to say there. Markings are a bit sparse, so uh, this is obviously a 9mm Bergman caliber. Now uh, roughly the first 110 were actually made in a 30 caliber cartridge, uh, and then they switched to 9 Bergman, and, and the vast majority, roughly, well, 890 of them, of the thousand, were made in 9 Bergman. You will also find a serial number here on the bottom of the barrel. The magazines are serialized as well, this one's not a matching mag, so we have magazine 176. Pistol number 790, so a pretty late production pistol. The one other marking you will find on these is on top of that locking block where it says Bergman Mars Patent Brevet SGDG. So that same patent marking we've seen through this whole series of pistols, uh, this time coupled with a Bergman Mars designation. And last but not least I suppose we have a pair of German proof marks right there. So crown over crown over U. There's one on the barrel because it was a separate piece and then there's one on the frame. Now the shoulder stock attachment is this lanyard ring. This is on the, the base of the grip of all of the Bergman Mars pistols, and it's coupled with a slot here on the bottom of this stock lug. This button pivots out to one side. This one's a little sticky, closes nice and slow. You can see the retaining latch right in the middle. That latch goes through the center of that uh, lanyard ring and holds the stock in place. Interesting little feature to note here, these stock lugs are actually case hardened, so they got that nice cool coloring and that helps uh, keep them from getting beaten up and deformed over you with use. So to attach this we're going to put it on, and you can actually just snap it on because the top of that locking lug is uh, angled. So Little bit of a wobble to this. Um, some stock attachment systems are better than others, this one's easy to do and fairly simple and cheap, but it is a little bit a uh, little bit wobbly. Now there were three different styles of leather that were used. There's a smooth one, there's this kind of corrugated one, and then there's a, a more obviously ribbed uh, style of uh, leather used for the shoulder holsters. And as with so many pistol shoulder stocks of the day, this doubles as a holster. So we can take the flap off, there's a nice hinge here at the top, top opens up, you can slide the pistol in there and it's got a cutout for the grip. There we go, close that up, close the strap, and there you have this. You can then slide this on your belt, carry it around that way, or remove it, take the pistol out and use it as a shoulder holster for better shooting. Just a quick example here of a factory engraved, embellished version of the 1903. We'll take a closer look at these, at this one, a little bit later in a separate video where we're going to look at some of the other embellished uh, Bergman models as well. But just wanted to give you a little sneak peek at that. Alright, now these two are a pair of 45 caliber Trials pistols of the Bergman Mars model 1903. 
This one is marked with a C11. This one's pretty much unmarked with the exception of magazine serial number 2 on it. And there are a couple differences between these and the standard guns. Um, obviously the caliber is different, the magazines are larger, the, the barrel is larger. And we see a few differences between these two pistols individually. Uh, most notably, the, the, we have a standard, standard uh, lanyard loop here and we have a swivel ring on this pistol. Seems like kind of a weird thing to go out of your way to change. Um, there may have been some specific military requirement where that made sense, I suppose. So if we compare the, uh, the C11, which I believe is the British Trials gun, or one of the British Trials guns, to a standard uh, Bergman, you can see there's really not much difference. Um, they use the same frame. You would normally expect the 45 caliber gun to have a larger frame than the 9mm, but in this case it, it just really didn't. So it seems to have been a, a relatively simple conversion to make. So you can see a little bit of the difference here. This is the 9mm standard gun, this is one of the 45 trials guns. If we take our 9mm magazine, it rattles around in the magwell, and our 45 caliber magazine won't fit in the smaller 9mm gun. So they did have to make some change to the frame, or at least to the magazine well, but uh, the rest of it seems very similar. Um, I guess you can also see that this has a couple beveled edges down here, where this one is, is rounded. Um, so a few slight aesthetic differences, in fact the, the front sights are slightly different as well, right up there. Um, but mechanically the 45 caliber gun is exactly the same, and doesn't appear to have required a, a very substantial change. Let's take a quick look at the other sides here. Um, we have this guy is the British one, this one is, I believe, the American Trials gun. There's one little subtle difference you can see between these two, and that is the little cutouts right here on the side of the bolt are just slightly different. So probably, well I'm sure handmade, they didn't make very many of these uh, in 45. It was kind of a kind of a long shot. At this point in history, the British military, oh by the way the hammers are also different, we have a spur hammer on the British gun and a rounded hammer um, on the American gun. The spur hammer was standard for all the 1903s, the round hammer is kind of, well it's unusual for this pattern of gun. Uh, at any rate, I was saying the, the UK military would have been a, a, a great contract to get, that would have been potentially a lot of guns, um, and the US less so. Uh, in 1903, 1905, the US wasn't a particularly substantial military force. However, if you've already made one of the guns in 45, well it's not that much work more to make one in 45 ACP for the American trials, and you know, it's not like that would be a bad contract to get. But it might not have justified making its own gun if the US were the only country that was interested in a 45 auto version. So the C11 here on what is, I believe, the British Trials gun uh, would have originally designated Construction 11 for 11 millimeter, which is how the Germans would have referred to a 45 caliber version of the pistol. Well, thank you guys for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. Not often we get to take a look at uh, a handful of 1903 Bergman Mars pistols in the same place, and very rarely the 45 caliber trials guns. So if you enjoyed this sort of footage, this sort of video, please consider checking out my Patreon page. It's funding from folks there that makes it possible for me to travel around, find these guns, and bring them to you guys. Thanks for watching.